Patent for Ramanavale and Fitness to Dive by Peter de Noble, performed by Dr. Franz Grenier. The Patent for Ramanavale and Fitness to Dive Consensus Workshop was held on June 17, 2015 in Montreal, Canada. The Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society, or UHMS, and DAN invited experts to review the current state of knowledge about the diagnosis of patent for Ramanavale, or PFO, evaluation and mitigation of individual risk, and assessing how PFOs affect divers' safety. Dan published the proceedings of the workshop, including the consensus statement, which is available online. A PFO is a passage in the wall between the right and left atria of the heart. It can be found in about 25% of adults. Its size and the degree of blood flow through it may vary. In a small percentage of people, a PFO allows for continuous passage of blood through the right atrium to the left, a spontaneous right-to-left shunt. In some people, the right-to-left shunt, or RLS, occurs when the pressure on the right atrium exceeds the pressure in the left. This may happen after relieving a temporary obstruction to blood flow in the heart, such as following a Valsalva maneuver or straining while lifting, sniffing, coughing, or passing stool. Spontaneous or provoked RLSs may be seen in 10 to 15% of adults. A PFO with RLS has long been suspected for so-called paradoxical embolism, wherein bubbles or particles are carried in venous blood, bypass the pulmonary or lung filter, and enter the arterial circulation to block the flow to a terminal vessel, called embolism. This causes an ischemic or an oxygen and blood flow starvation injury of the tissues downstream of the obstruction. The most common form of embolism is caused by blood clots from peripheral veins passing through a PFO and causing a stroke. It may also occur in divers, post-dive, when a lot of venous gas emboli or VGE are present. Paradoxical embolism caused by VGE may manifest with symptoms that are neurologically similar to a stroke. Usually, neurological, spinal, cerebral and vestibular decompression illness or cutaneous decompression sickness. The overall incidence of decompression sickness in recreational divers is 2 to 4 per 10,000 dives. And the incidence of neurological decompression sickness is less than 1 per 10,000 dives. In the presence of a PFO, however, the incidence can increase about four times. While the average risk for divers with a PFO seems low, for some individuals the risk may be greater than the overall statistics would predict. The main question regarding PFOs and diving is how to identify individuals who are likely to be at such an increased risk for decompression sickness and how to mitigate this. The workshop's consensus guidelines provide some answers. In summary, who should be tested for a PFO? The consensus maintains that no routine screening for PFOs is necessary in all divers. It recommends, however, that divers with a history of more than one episode of decompression sickness that involves cerebral, spinal, or vestibular cochlear or cutaneous manifestations should be tested for a PFO. On the other hand, divers with mild, other than skin decompression sickness, need not be tested. How is a PFO tested? Experts who are well practiced in the procedures should conduct the test. The most appropriate testing method is the so-called transthoracic echocardiogram or TTE with bubble contrast and a provocative maneuver such as Valsalva or sniffing. Other methods seem to be suboptimal. Interpretation of findings. A spontaneous shunt is the passage of contrast bubbles from the right to the left atrium without a provocative maneuver. This is considered very likely to increase the risk of decompression sickness resulting from a lot of venous gas emboli. A large provoked shunt means that a lot of VGE will be passing after Valsalva maneuver or sniffing. This is likely to open with any kind of straining and is recognized as a risk factor for previously listed forms of decompression sickness. The presence of smaller shunts is associated with lower risk 
that should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. It is important to note that the detection of a PFO in divers who suffered an episode of decompression sickness is not proof that the PFO caused that particular episode. Risk mitigation. Divers with a diagnosed PFO that's likely to be associated with an increased risk for decompression sickness should consult a diving physician and consider options that best suit their needs and diving styles with a thorough understanding of the risks and benefits of every option. The options may include stopping diving, diving more conservatively to produce the chances of venous gas emboli and not to strain after diving to avoid opening a PFO and provoking right to left shunting, or to have the PFO closed. Conservative diving includes strategies to reduce the risk of significant venous bubbles post-dive and shunting bubbles through a PFO. Since there is significant variability in venous gas emboli occurring amongst divers and in the same diver over dive, options should be discussed with a diving medical expert before making the decision. For more details about conservative diving, see the article in Alert Diver. The closure of a PFO may reduce the risk of decompression sickness, but it's not a guarantee that it won't occur. Also, closing a PFO is not entirely risk-free. Deep and long dives may cause decompression sickness without venous gas emboli passing into the arterial side. So, even in the absence of a PFO, venous gas emboli may pass to the arterial side through shunts within the lungs that tend to open with exercise, low oxygen or stress hormone stimulation. Return to diving after PFO closure. Diving should not be resumed before full closure is confirmed and another contrast echocardiogram is performed at least three months after the closure procedure. Divers should not return to diving as long as there is a need to take potent anti-platelet or anti-clotting medications. If the test at three months or more after closure shows the closure is complete, the divers prescribe only disprin or aspirin and nothing for clotting prevention as such. Then diving can be resumed. Divers should always remember that the main factor causing decompression sickness is the dive exposure itself, in other words, the depth, time and ascent rate. With a significant exposure, anybody is at risk for decompression sickness. Most people who get decompression sickness do not have a PFO, however. Divers with complete closure of a PFO may avoid those episodes they could have had in the past, but if they engage in extreme risk diving, their risks will be the same as for divers without a PFO, but that is not zero risk.